right, perfect. Well, hello, NCIA members and supporters, and welcome to another edition of NCIA's Industry Essentials Educational Webinar Series. NCIA's Industry Essentials is a new weekly educational series featuring a variety of programs, allowing us to provide you with timely, engaging, and essential education when you need it most. My name is Brian Gilbert, and I serve as the events manager here at NCIA. And I'm very pleased to have the opportunity of introducing yet another fantastic educational opportunity for you all this afternoon. In case you missed it, we will be conducting a moderated Q&A session at the conclusion of the presentation. So if you have any questions for the panelists, don't hesitate to pose them by either using the Q&A feature available along the bottom toolbar, which will allow our panelists to answer questions in real time throughout the presentation, or by sending them as a message inside the chat room to all panelists or everyone in the meeting and our team will compile them for discussion. On the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, we find ourselves at an unprecedented moment in modern human history with clear skies, empty streets, and bottomed out gas prices across the globe. Sadly, this moment of natural recovery and restoration has been spurred not by our own hands, but due to a global health pandemic. But we've never had a better opportunity to evaluate our impact on the planet in a more subjective manner and hopefully use this as a chance to change course in some areas which dramatically need a different approach. Let's face it, if we're all in need of anything at this moment, it's some silver lining to this dramatically depressing situation so many of us find ourselves in. To that end, we've assembled an all-star panel of cannabis cultivators who are all pioneering some amazing strategies to reduce the impact of our emerging industry will have on the future of our planet. I've had the pleasure of seeing many of these panelists present at our previous conferences, so I know you're all in store for a very informative and thought-provoking conversation surrounding a variety of sustainability practices within the cannabis industry. And with that, please enjoy today's session entitled Policy Council Conversations, being moderated by Caitlin Urso, Environmental Consultant at the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Take it away, Caitlin. Thanks, Brian. Happy 50th. 50th Earth Day, everyone. Um, thank you, NCIA, for adapting to the current state of business and providing this remote educational opportunity. I am Caitlin Urso. I work for the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment as a free environmental consultant for small businesses. I specialize in helping craft breweries and cannabis businesses reduce their environmental impacts. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time to join NCIA, me, and a very talented panel today to discuss environmental sustainability within the cannabis industry. I'm honored to share this time with such brilliant colleagues and friends. Sarah Davis, who has her own sustainability consulting firm. Then we're gonna hear from Emily Long, who is the communications manager for Rocky Mountain Reagents and has an environmental master's degree. Then we will hear from four marijuana cultivation companies. Our first cultivator is James Schwartz, who is a nurse and CEO of Cascade High Organics, an Oregon-based sustainable cannabis company. Our next three speakers are with Colorado Indoor Cultivation Operations. We'll hear from Peter Marcus, who is the Communications Director for Terrapin Care Station and also has a background in politics. Then we'll hear from Brandon Ray, who does Compliance and Sustainability for Native Roots. And last up, we will be hearing from Andrew Alfred, the Chief Scientist for LiveWell Enlightened Health. Andrew leads LiveWell's data-driven approach to environmental efficiency. So let's start things off by uh, defining sustainability. Sustainability focuses on meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to also meet their needs. The concept of sustainability is composed of three pillars, economic, environmental, and social. These are also known as the three Ps, people, planet, and profits. These three things need to work together um, in order to ensure sustainability. As a business, who supports sustainability, we need to reduce, reuse, and recycle. We need to strategically manage the natural resources that support our core business functions so that we can sustain business, business growth while being an asset to our community now and in the future. So in order for the, a, a decision to be sustainable, it has to have not just environmental benefits, but benefits for the community in which you operate and also be a smart business decision. As project manager, I am excited to announce that NCIA will be releasing an environmental sustainability white paper 
focused on the cannabis industry later this summer. The white paper is being written by the NCIA Environmental Committee that I lead and consists of about 20 environmental and cannabis experts. The white paper will focus on the environmental impacts, best management practices, and policy considerations for the cannabis industry needed to position the industry as a leader in environmental sustainability. I will now pass it off to Sarah Davis, who will give more of an overview of the contents of the coming white paper. Thanks, Caitlin. Happy Earth Day, everyone. My name is Sarah Davis, and I'm the founder and CEO of SRD Consulting. I have um, about a decade of experience in the solar industry and more recently worked at Tesla for a couple years building out electric vehicle infrastructure. And I'm really excited uh, to be part of the white paper effort and to be speaking with you all today. Um, so we're at a, a unique moment in time, um, not just in light of COVID, but as the newly or emerging industry seeks to transition from underground production into a world of land use regulation, uh, the cannabis industry provides a unique opportunity for us to reevaluate the role of agriculture in a mechanized and globalized world. Uh, before the founding of the United States and even further back before the planting of the first cannabis fields, land use has been changed and driven by expanding global populations. And those populations increase pressure on our land resources and overall sustainability of our planet. So as we look to integrate the cannabis plant into our greater American and global economies, we must ensure that we do so thoughtfully, knowing that we can cultivate without exploitation, that we can grow without degrading the natural environment, and that it's in our best interest to take lessons learned and apply them holistically. So within the white paper, uh, we frame both the historic, existing, and emerging industries in light of both the Farm Bill legalizing hemp nationwide and also assuming that federal legalization of marijuana is coming. Uh, we, we took this opportunity as a way to set the standard, uh, not only for the industry, but as a way for the industry to set the standard globally um, in terms of cultivation best practices. As Caitlin mentioned, uh, we explore uh, several topics through the lens of impacts, best management practices, and policies, and we really let the plant lead um, how we organize the white paper. So we start with the soil um, and we look at what inputs are required in order to grow and cultivate this plant. Um, we then uh, go on to explore some of the impacts um, that the cultivation and retail and processing have on both our water, air, and energy. And then finally, we conclude with an analysis of the waste. Um, how can we be better in terms of how we're packaging um, and also in what we're doing with the bulk plant waste uh, as a result? So um, kind of touching on the first chapter is land use and soils that's covered on the next slide. And really what we did, uh, we had a great team. As Caitlin mentioned, there's about 25 of us that have been working on the white paper. Um, and I specifically led the land use and soils chapter with a lot of insight from PhD soil scientist, Judy Daniels. And really what we focused on is the fact that cultivation within cannabis is at multiple scales. So we looked at not only industrial hemp, smaller outdoor craft cultivation of marijuana, as well as indoor cultivation. I really tried to look at what are potential impacts. Um, some of these are ones that are impactful from agriculture in general, but really focusing on specific impacts from the cannabis plant um, and cannabis best practices. And one of the things that we really tried to highlight throughout this chapter is it's not all quote unquote bad news. Um, there are a lot of positive points um, about the plant, uh, phytoremediation being a key one, um, and that you have to make sure when you're going into cultivation that you're taking into account that this is a plant that absorbs um, things from the soil, from water, and holds them indefinitely. And so we really laid out um, a plan both for current cultivators, kind of the, the OG cultivators out there, as well as people that are newly entering the industry, so that they start out on the right foot that they're thinking about things like integrated pest management over pesticides, um, and also provides a foundation for how we can integrate cannabis 
both hemp and marijuana into a larger agricultural framework in terms of organic certifications and the possibility of creation of new programs. In terms of water, um, you know, we all recognize that it's a finite resource. I think one of the things that we really tried to head on is that sourcing of water is really key. Um, and when you're looking at outdoor cultivation, um, there are some considerations in terms of where that water goes after it's been applied to the plant uh, and what it carries with it. As well, in indoor cultivation, we have to recognize that we're putting additional demand on municipal systems and we need to ensure that the infrastructure capacity and access is such that we can continue to expand cultivation in areas where it makes sense. Some best management practices um, that were addressed in the white paper as it relates to water include rainwater catchment um, that can impact or that could be helpful for both indoor and outdoor cultivation, as well as uh, some information about monitoring and sensors that you can use to just really make sure that your water usage is as tight as possible, that you're not overusing, um, and then ways that you can filter or recycle different types of water that you're using, whether it's condensation from your HVAC system or water that's being applied to the plant that maybe could go through a filtration system and get reapplied. And before I turn it over to Emily to touch on the last two chapters, uh, energy is one that I personally am really passionate about. Um, it, there's two sides of the coin, of course, demand and supply. Um, and you'll hear from a lot of the cultivators we've got here today about some of the energy efficiency they've done to reduce their demand. Uh, I personally am really interested and excited about federal legalization and the renewable energy and battery storage technologies that uh, that would unlock. So stay tuned. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Emily Long, who is a environmental policy uh, wonk and the com communications and marketing uh, lead for Rocky Mountain Reagents. Hi, thank you, Sarah. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in and um, celebrating Earth Day today. My name is Emily Long. I have a master's in environmental sustainability and public policy. Um, I'm currently working, as was mentioned earlier, in communications and marketing for Rocky Mountain Reagents, which is based in Golden, Colorado, and has been open since 1951, supplying um, chemicals to a wide variety of industries um, and working very hard to fairly serve the cannabis industry. Um, so let's just jump right in here um, to one of the final chapters. We touch on um, air and impacts to air. Um, we talk about the impacts to the air quality that need to be considered when deciding best management practices. And there are four major impacts to note. First, uh, during plant cultivation, odor from terpenes and volatile organic compounds both contribute to uh, reducing air quality. Um, the second impact to point out is that during processing of cannabis into consumer products, the use of solvents can lead to additional air pollution. Uh, thirdly, the electricity typically used to power indoor marijuana growing facilities releases greenhouse gas emissions, which are linked to issues of climate change. And finally, we look at the extensive transportation of cannabis products by way of carbon emitting vehicles as a result of supply chain constraints. Um, and it is important to note that we, we need additional testing and data collection in order to quantify the emissions from um, the last two, the electricity and the transportation used in the cannabis industry to really fully understand and measure their impacts to public health and climate change. Um, and as far as best management practices, the use of carbon filtration in indoor growing facilities is one of, the, one of those current um, BMPs deployed to help mitigate harmful air pollutants from entering the air. Um, this is done through a process of emission and odor adsorption by the carbon. Uh, additionally, cold traps and condensers in closed loop extraction systems are used um, frequently to reduce solvent loss and their associated air emissions. Um, and then as, as with most technology driven solutions, it's always important to measure um, the emission controls um, being deployed against the electricity used to run them so as to not simply redirect the negative impact. Um, and just before we pop over to the next slide, I wanted to mention the free cannabis odor webinar, um, which is going to be next week. And there's a link there at uh, drgreenhouse.com to register for that. Um, you guys should all take a look at that. It's gonna be great. Um, last, lastly, in the white paper, we talk about um, the impacts um, 
to waste um, and waste management. Uh, waste is, uh, as we all know, is a highly visible environmental impact associated with retail driven businesses. So it is very important for the cannabis industry to take steps to reduce, reuse and recycle. Two major contributors to waste uh, production from the cannabis industry are from the green waste, stocks, stems, and other plant byproducts, um, as well as the single use disposable and redundant packaging um, associated with the retail. Um, the 50-50 rule for cannabis plant waste disposal in landfills contributes to greenhouse gas emissions of particularly methane, which has a 25 times the global warming impact potential than CO2. Um, uh, additionally, single-use disposable packaging, which includes yeah. bio, eco, eco and, and compostable packaging materials, all contribute to okay. issues of linear waste model um, as their end-of-life volatility pollutes oceans and, and is often hauled offshores. Uh, best management practices around waste and in the cannabis industry that, that the cannabis industry uses to mitigate impacts and develop more regenerative waste models include developing reusable and refillable packaging and waste to energy conversions. Um, it's important to put the onus on the producers of waste contributing products to extend take back programs, which can help lead us towards more loop waste models where waste is transferred back and forth between producers and consumers instead of just ending up in landfills um, in that linear waste model. Um, and then lastly, um, waste to energy technology such as on-site anaerobic digestion is another best management practice that can help plant waste such as methane convert, convert back into energy which can be used to power cultivation facilities. Uh, additionally, CO2 from plant waste can also be captured and reused during extraction and processing of cannabis. Um, and lastly, the plant byproduct can also be used again as a nutrient rich fertilizer for continued cultivation. Um, and all of these practices together help lead to 100% diversion from landfills, which ultimately reduces the negative impact to our lovely environment. Um, I thank you for your time. Uh, next, we have James Schwartz, CEO of Cascade High Organics, and he is going to share about his very commendable industry practices in the state of Oregon. Well, hello everyone. Uh, Caitlin, Emily, Sarah, great job. Uh, really appreciate what you guys are doing to to help kind of push the industry forward. Uh, to the rest of my panelists here, um, thank you for being a part of an industry that's growth is helping to restructure uh, what we know about farm agriculture and and how we can best utilize modern technology and sustainable practices and the um in in this new industry that's allowing us uh, a lot of flexibility to, to grow as sort of this independent arm of uh farm ag business and and really pushing all of us to to be better um briefly i'm a nurse by trade as caitlin mentioned i've always come to cannabis uh through what's important to the end consumer, the user, the patient, whatever you want to call them. And uh, I, I've tried to implement that in the way I've cultivated cannabis um, dating back 20 years ago to uh, the present uh, with Cascade High. Uh, so with cannabis cultivation, um, you know, how do, how, how do we apply some of these techniques and these things that we're learning from studies like the white paper that are bringing out and, and things that are that Caitlin's doing at, at the resources department. Um, how do we apply those to, to what we're doing on our farms? For, for me and, and our mantra at Cascade High, um, our tagline is socially conscious cannabis cultivation. And what that means to me is is going back to that triple P bottom line uh, that that Caitlin mentioned. You know what's what's best for people, the planet, and and we believe that profits eventually follow if you if you protect those two things. And I'm go back to the old adage of of keep it simple, stupid. So when I I approach cannabis cultivation, I look at those basically those areas that were just covered by Emily and Sarah and Caitlin. Uh, you know, proper water, proper soil, proper sun or lighting, and proper air. Um, I think that organic cultivation is really important to that end consumer. 
I realize that that's not everybody's cultivation model. And uh, I can appreciate that we each have different business strategies that we apply um, to our cultivation. But at Cascade High, I'm, as I said, I, as a nurse, I, it's really important for me to, to be conscious of what's going into my cannabis as cannabis is a bioremediating plant. It's sucking up everything around it. Um, whether it's from the air, whether it's from the soil, uh, whether it's from the light. And so we really have to be conscious of those things as we um, cultivate. So with water then, um, how, do we, how do we do those things to both protect the planet's water resources as well as protect the plant? Um, I know that there are a lot of uh, cultivators who use hydroponics and I, I don't mean to, to to speak ill of, of anybody who does. I know that it's a very uh, productive, very prolific uh, cultivation strategy. Um, my concerns with, with hydroponics is a, a couple of things. Number one, um, you know, what we see when we uh, flood water tables is we utilize additional water that doesn't need to be utilized. Um, I think some of the fellow panelists will talk about how they've remediated that and, and what they've done to improve on that. Um, but flushing those systems, um, additionally, it's extremely difficult to cultivate uh, hydroponically uh, without using synthetic nutrients because of what it does to the, to the lines in, in the watering systems. And so we have to be aware that you know, when we're doing that, we need to, we need to really pay attention to, um, are we maintaining those proper healthy limits in, in those uh, mineral salt fertilizers and synthetic nutrient mixes? As well as then, what's the cost to the business as well as the planet? Um, you know, when you, when you look at costs of nutrient mixes and nutrient lines, they get really expensive really quick. Um, and so when you look at your business model, when you're thinking about cultivating and you're thinking about what's important, don't necessarily think just because you can add a bunch of nutrients to a plant to make it that much more productive. When you actually look at that cost per gram uh, for, for what it costs you to cultivate it and, and what it's returning, there are, there are ways that you can uh, adequately produce quality cannabis without necessarily needing to feed a bunch of nutrients. Nutrients, and then it's what it where's where's that water going uh, that you're that you're consuming um, when you use hydroponics. A lot of times you're flooding it when even if in a soil environment you're overwatering. There's a lot of runoff, so we need to be a pay attention about how much water we're using, where is that runoff going, um, and and the need to protect our rivers and streams and oceans, and and that's certainly important to us as well as I think everybody on this panel. Next thing is what's in the soil. Uh, what is your what is your cultivation media? Um, for me, uh, the way I believe that we cultivate the best cannabis is to to keep it connected to Mother Nature, and so that's living microbial soils, uh, health, healthy mycorrhizal sphere, um, that fungus or that bacteria eating those sugars, those fungus eating the bacteria, creating that. Uh, microbial network of mycorrhizals that are feeding that plant. Um, soil holds water better, so, so it's, you're going to use less water naturally when you use soil. Um, and properly amended soil requires very little nutrient supplement, and so you can start to minimize uh, those additive nutrients, and that factors into that again that cost of uh, uh, of production of what it what does it cost me to produce that gram of cannabis and how does that fit into my business model and my strategy um sun or light is that next point that we need to touch on um clearly uh lighting is one of the most uh intensive critical resource aspects of cultivating cannabis and the reason that is is depending on what lighting you use that reflects on how much air conditioning you need. Um, I threw up some kind of general statistics, but if it costs you about a thousand dollars to run uh, 10 lights on those 10 lights, you probably need close to five tons of AC. Um, those are serious costs when they start to add up. Um, for us at Cascade High, we 
we've built our infrastructure around how do we utilize the sun and those other resources around us most efficiently and so for me that's light uh, light of uh, efficient light assist light depth greenhouses um, that's rainwater collection um, certainly in Oregon we have a ton of water don't have a ton of light but I can tell you that you know between April and November, uh, my, my electricity is about a tenth of what it is when I'm running during the winter time. Um, last point I want to make, LEDs are great. They're showing great promise. Um, but I think that you really need to understand how LEDs work. Yeah, they save energy and efficiency, but oftentimes you're adding 20 to 30% more fixtures um, to achieve that same sort of uh, light spread across your canopy. And so, um, it doesn't always add up the way that we think it does. And so be conscientious about what you're choosing to use light. And, you know, as it's mentioned in, on that slide there, you know, cannabis was grown indoors initially because it was illegal. You're trying to keep it out of the view of, of government regulators. Uh, most agricultural products are produced outdoor. And the reason for that is the sun is free and it provides the most uh, complete spectrum of light to be able to cultivate and, and your cannabis in the best way. Last thing is then air and HVAC. As we touched on with light, with your HVAC, it's dependent upon how much cooling do you need. So if you're running 100 lights, you're looking at 50 tons of cooling. Um, those sort of negative feedback loops in terms of if I use more light, now I got to use more AC. Uh, those things are all consuming more energy. It, it's great to want to reduce the amount of energy that we use uh, through more efficient lighting, but when you take the sun, uh, you get that for free. When you can put in some chiller walls or uh, other sorts of natural cooling methods that are going to, to produce that same sort of cooling effect in your environment at a more more efficient rate even better um, so clearly outdoor cultivation is the way that a lot of us want to go it's not always uh, effective especially dependent upon the type of product that we want the one major issue with with outdoor cultivation is the inability to control environmental factors and that goes for pests and everything else um, the last thing I didn't mention in this slide and one of the ways that we really need to think as cultivators how we can be more sustainable is what is our IPM? IPM is integrated pest management. Let's look at how to use biologicals effectively. How can we use uh, essential oils that are healthy for the plant as well as the planet? How can we get away from those harmful chemicals that are uh, responsible for um, us ingesting heavy metals or toxic cancerous chemicals from our cannabis. With that, uh, I believe we have, uh, oh, is it Andrew? Oh, Terrapin Station um, and Peter Marcus. I apologize, Peter, but I'm really excited to hear what you guys are doing. No worries. Virtual chats are uh, are strange to to figure out. Um, hi everyone. Happy Earth Day. Um, this is Peter Marcus with Terrapin Care Station. Terrapin is a ten year old cannabis company uh, based out of Boulder, Colorado. We're a national company. We're um, in Colorado, Pennsylvania, opening in Michigan early summer, and just got a couple of licenses in Missouri. So kind of expanding pretty quickly um, over the past 10 years. Um, Terrapin has always uh, focused heavily on corporate social responsibility. Um, we actually have uh, divided our um, CSR efforts into five different buckets. It's justice initiatives, human needs, political advocacy, education, arts and culture, and uh, veteran services. Sustainability falls under our human needs category. Um, and being based in Boulder um, has had a sort of effect on us and our thinking. Boulder is very progressive, very forward looking community. Sustainability is heavily prioritized um, there. 
Um, and so from the start, we kind of always had um, an eye towards sustainability. Let's move on on the slides here and get into the meat of this. So I want to really focus here right now on packaging. Packaging is perhaps one of the um, biggest obstacles we faced in the cannabis industry when it comes to sustainability. And a large reason for this is that packaging is prescribed in the law. Um, you know, the, especially when you go back to the beginning of, of legal programs, uh, governments were very concerned about access to children, about, you know, uh, having product that gets out um, into the wrong hands, things like that. And so there was a lot of very, very stringent rules prescribed to us as an industry when it comes to packaging, some of which is difficult to get around. You got to have exit bags, things like that. It's layer upon layer upon layer of packaging, which really doesn't help us much in the sustainability fight. So Terrapin decided to um, look for alternatives there. And one of the things that we're doing is we're using, um, uh, it's for our packaging, the plastic is actually made from renewable polyethylene produced from Brazilian sugar cane. It's a renewable source. It's recyclable in the same chain used for recycling traditional polyethylene from fossil sources. It's recyclable. It's even compostable, which is pretty amazing. Um, and so that was sort of our effort to um, look at alternatives around packaging, knowing, of course, that we have to follow rules and we have to have a lot of packaging. What can we do to cut back on that? And this has been successful. I did see a question pop up in the Q&A about recycling and why don't dispensaries do take backs um, for recycling jars and packaging and things like that. Um, Believe it or not, going back to uh, the rules and regs, there was some concern in the beginning about packaging take backs um, from dispensaries. They didn't want the possibility of a product coming back into the stores if packages weren't completely emptied. Um, that has eased and most dispensaries, a lot of dispensaries, I should say, we do it, um, do offer recycling take backs in our stores for those packaging. And it's not just our jars that we use um, environmental uh, sustainability packaging um, materials with. We do it for our boxes. We do it for our dube tubes. We do it for as much packaging as we can. Um, we've actually won some industry awards um, around our packaging, um, which we're you know, pleased about. But uh, what's interesting is that government folks actually encourage us to apply for these kinds of awards because it can sort of motivate other businesses. You know, you see companies are getting awards for sustainable packaging and environmental practices and things like that. And then it creates a little bit of competition um, where other companies will want to actually step up to the plate and, and uh, participate themselves. Okay, let's uh, move on to looking at some of the growing. Um, got a great overview on some outdoor growing. Now we'll talk a little bit about indoor. I'm not gonna get too much into the science because I am not a grower and we have some very excellent experts on this panel who are. So I'll just give you the overview. Um, the first thing I'm gonna do is not sugarcoat everything. Um, you know, the bottom line is, you know, we in the cannabis industry do oftentimes like to spin. Um, it's our job is to, you know, show the bright side of legalization all the time because we're trying to um, push this uh, across the country and across the world. Well, there are some things that you can't sugarcoat, which is the fact that this industry is not uh, overly sustainable. And a large part of that has to do with energy. Um, the technology, and we touched on this a little bit in the last presentation, but the technology is catching up, but it's not exactly there yet. You know, when it comes to mimicking Mother Earth and, and, and growing plants indoors, you're going to use a lot of energy. So we have tried to um, cut back on that in ways we can, obviously using off-peak times, but more importantly is using LED lighting um, wherever we can, which for us is um, of course in the vegetative state. And we have research and development rooms where we're um, uh, uh, experimenting with LED lighting in the flowering stage, as well as other new technologies that are coming along for flowering. Um, so we do try to you know, conserve the energy where we can, but again, we are going to start to see over the next couple of years, some new technologies coming out that'll help with that. 
When it comes to water for indoor um, cultivation, it's not as bad as people would expect. Um, we use a lot of water and we obviously try to reuse and recapture where we can. Um, some of the later panelists will talk a little bit more about that. Um, but you know, it is difficult to recapture and recycle water. Um, you're using a lot of nutrients. You have to make sure your base levels are right. So it can be complicated, but we obviously do do it where we can. Um, you know, one of our facilities uses about what five households would use when it comes to um, uh, annual water usage. So that is obviously more, but when you're considering an industrial operation, it's not insane. Um, and so obviously we try to do what we can in those situations, um, but, um, but really the true uh, problem is with the energy use. Okay, let's uh, move on to uh, talk about um, uh, our partnerships with the state. Uh, and we have uh, CDPHE on this panel, so um, further questions can be directed there. But basically, under Governor Jared Polis, uh, the state has been wonderful when it comes to um, focusing on sustainability as it pertains to the cannabis industry. Um, they've done, and this is going back a little while now, they started uh, allowing for voluntary audits of facilities. Um, it's basically the state comes in, it's a voluntary situation. We conducted one at our largest facility. Um, they come in, they analyze everything you're doing, how you're using your energy, how you're using your water, how your facilities are built. Um, I mentioned this in a question, in an answer to one of the questions that came on this we do try to build our facilities with lead standards in mind to because when you build facilities with conservation in mind the whole process goes a lot better so the state came in and did an audit um, you know found out the ways we're doing things right the ways we're doing things wrong we were proud of the audit and found that we're doing um, a lot of things right but you know they made recommendations around us upgrading our insulations considering switching cleaning products more plant-based products experimenting with upgraded lighting, which we just talked about plans there. And as I mentioned earlier, to seek additional awards to um, motivate others in the industry to carry the torch. So uh, the state has been wonderful. The audits have been great. We're already uh, starting to um, put some of that stuff into play. And it has been a transition, and I'm gonna wrap up here real quick, but um, it has been a transition uh, for us as an industry into this polis administration under Governor Hickenlooper's administration. And I forgot to mention this prior to the cannabis industry, I was a political reporter for um, 15 years. Um, I came into the cannabis industry a little over two years ago. Um, so I've really watched the cannabis industry unfold once very objectively as a reporter from when I was like one of the first reporters to show up at a press conference by Safer with Mason Tavert and Brian Vicente going back to 2005. And now here we are, a critical essential industry in the massive pandemic. The evolution has been unbelievable to see. That evolution has also uh, transferred into Jared Polis coming in as governor following John Hickenlooper as governor. John Hickenlooper did not have much of a focus on working with the cannabis industry on these things. Governor Polis has committed to working with the industry on things like sustainability, tourism, other aspects. So I do believe that we'll um, start to see uh, some more part progress and some additional uh, partnerships with the state. All right. Um, Sorry for talking fast, trying to get through a lot. Um, so um, we're gonna now hear from Brandon Ray. He's the Senior Compliance Officer and Sustainability Program Coordinator for Native Roots. So thank you everyone and hello, Brandon. Awesome, thank you, Peter. Um, and thanks to Caitlin and NCIA and the other presenters for getting this webinar organized. It's nice to still be able to celebrate Earth Day and get together and talk about this kind of stuff, even with all the other craziness going on in the world. Um, and first of all, uh, just to give a little background on Native Roots, we are a vertically integrated cannabis company here in Colorado, which means we uh, grow, process, and uh, have the retail fronts here. Um, we also have uh, retail locations in Canada. Um, most of my comments will be kind of focused on more of the Colorado side, um, but these do overlap with our Canadian operations on the retail front where applicable. And first thing I want to touch on is something Caitlin and others have kind of mentioned, it's the Kind of the three tiers of sustainability um, on the next slide talks about just the social environmental and economic 
And it's important to kind of keep that in mind because all these are important aspects of sustainability and none of these are in a silo. These all work together and important to keep in mind. So Native Roots tries to take a comprehensive approach to make sure we're addressing all these important factors. Um, and as an approach to that, Native Roots actively participates in the Denver Cannabis Sustainability Work Group um, and participates in the annual Cannabis Sustainability Symposium here in Denver. And those are great opportunities for us to engage with other businesses, regulators, even some supplemental industries like waste haulers to make sure we're all having the same conversations that we're getting as much opinions and perspectives from everybody as we can, because um, none of these are silos. Everything feeds into each other. And it's important for us to make sure we're communicating um, both within the industry and throughout the society. And also internally, we do have a Native Roots Sustainability Committee. It just helps to kind of bring different department leadership together to have these conversations and make sure we're you know, involving everybody in the conversation so that, for one, we're not doing anything that's going to catch anybody off guard, but also to, you know, make sure that anybody that has any ideas can bring those to the table and make sure we're including everybody in the company from top to bottom, because everybody finds this very important, and we want to make sure we're getting everybody's ideas. Um, and for those efforts and some efforts I'll touch on in more detail, in 2019 and 2020, we have received three sustainability-focused awards for our efforts. Um, those are from MJ BizCon, the aforementioned Cannabis Sustainability Symposium and the Denver Regional Council of Governments. Um, and on the next slide, I'll dive into our first program, which is our Way to Go Commuting Program. Um, this is a program we started around a year ago today that encourages our employees to use alternative commuting options, such as carpooling, transit, biking, even taking those little scooters around, basically anything that's not just driving by yourself to and from work. Um, and as you can see from that timeline there, we've seen great participation um, over time and that build up as we rolled this out. We do have incentives and resources available to all our Native Roots locations, whether it's production, retail, or admin. Um, and we get a lot of those uh, resources and incentives from the Transportation Management Associations, the TMAs that cover Colorado. Um, a lot of those are focused on the front range, but are, we make that available to all of our locations around the state. Um, and we've, if you see there on our numbers for 2020, and this is just 2020, so January up through about February, I think is when I pulled these numbers. Um, we are the number one company in the states um, in that category for tracking trips. Um, and this is not for cannabis companies, but all companies. Um, so that's something we're very proud of. We actually have a pretty good lead in the number of trips, as you can see there. And the reason why that's important, the big picture is obviously reducing greenhouse gases. The less vehicles you have on the road, obviously the less you're pumping into the atmosphere. Um, but even more of a local focus, um, the air quality and the ease on traffic is very important. Nobody um, in Colorado likes driving back into Denver from snowboarding or hiking and seeing that smog over the city. So any little bit we can do to help kind of decrease that impact is obviously very important. And then some of the personal perks uh, obviously help save some gas money if you're carpooling or if you're not having to drive. Um, we're able to get those gift card resources and some other incentive to our employees, which is nice and just conserve parking spaces, which is important for some of our more densely packed locations. Um, just so you're not having to search around for parking so our customers have easy access to get to our business. And um, some of those results are why we will be receiving the 2020 Employee, Employer of the Year Award from way to go um, They kind of had to postpone the ceremony for obvious reasons, um, but we're very proud to uh, get that honor from them this year. Um, next thing I want to touch on is soil and fibrous waste. This has obviously come up uh, repeatedly, those are obviously two major outputs of indoor cannabis cultivation. Um, and in this context, I'm focusing on fibrous materials as defined in Colorado rules, which is stalks, stems, and root balls. But in theory, this could include leaves as well. Um, and obviously, the problem is that a lot of these materials are just sent to the landfill right now. As far as what our options are, with soil, um, you can either obviously repurpose and reuse, reuse those internally or externally. Internally, as some of the other people have referenced, it can be a bit of a challenge just for space. Um, also for contamination issues, you don't want microbes getting into the air and you know, contaminating your flower products um, since that you know, is tested before it goes to the stores. Um, so what we're mainly focusing on now is finding external partners for donations. And um, what we've gotten some good feedback on so far is community gardens and farmers who can take some of this you know, soil that's still very valuable, very good to use and uh, repurpose it for their usage. Um, so we're continuing to dig in on that, and that's been a very great resource that we've found so far. And then as far as fibrous products, um, we do have an R&D partnership in place with a materials processor in Colorado. They're still kind of working out their 
their investments kind of building out their facility and things like that um, to get that rolling. But we've been providing them with material to do some kind of R&D and test runs on this as they go forward. Um, so a lot of this, you know, is not, there's a lot of parallels, but it's a little bit different in cannabis um, industry. So just making sure we're following those extra regulations and stuff is very important. Um, next thing I want to touch on is the container collection, reuse, and recycling. Um, as others have pointed out, this is a pretty frequent criticism of the cannabis industry. Not that they were the only ones doing it, but it's something that I hear a lot about personally. Um, and as uh, we've alluded to, this wasn't even allowed in Colorado until January 1st of this year when they changed the rules to allow containers to be brought back in stores. Previously, there was concerns about um, contamination and just quote unquote, untracked product being in the store. Um, but uh, Colorado has, you know, eased those restrictions, opened up more opportunities for that. And um, just to kind of elaborate on the problem a little bit, you know, most people think, well, I can just throw it in my normal recycling, which isn't the wrong answer by any means. But in practicality, that can be an issue with actually getting the products recycled. If you take a look at that picture there, if you imagine like a small gram or eighth gram in that pile, it would be pretty hard to find and pull out. It's kind of like the worst game of Where's Waldo. Um, and even if you do pull that out, there's a lot of labeling that's acquired in the industry for obvious reasons. Um, but that can also cause problems with recyclers who are trying to pelletize the materials and that can cause issues with gumping up their machinery. Um, so it's, you know, making it difficult for them to get the product actually be recycled and makes it not as, as useful and valuable for them. So what we're doing at the moment is trying to partner with our waste haulers to almost create like a second stream of materials that's cannabis specific so that we make sure that's being collected, that it's getting recycled. It's not just going to the landfill. Um, that way we're not just kind of checking off a box for making sure it's actually happening on the back end. Um, and along those lines, we are planning to partner with the city of Denver on a pilot program for collection, potentially even reuse and recycling. Um, and that's kind of, you know, on hold right now with everything going on. Um, but we're involved in that city of Denver. Some of our other uh, par participants on this webinar are involved in that as well. And we're really looking forward to getting that rolling hopefully sometime in the near future. Um, next slide, I'll touch on energy and water efficiency. Um, one of the numbers I saw quoted a couple of years ago is around 4% of Denver energy use is, for, is from cannabis grows, which is a pretty staggering number. Um, and just kind of emphasizes how important it is to operate efficiently in that realm to make sure we're minimizing those impacts as possible. Um, and our cultivation operations have been independently evaluated to ensure we're operating at that optimal efficiency, including, you know, make sure we're keeping in mind the peak usage times for power, that our HVAC systems integrated well. Um, so we're continually doing that to make sure there's not anything else we can improve um, in that realm. And we've also switched to all LED bulbs in our bedrooms to reduce power usage and our Looking at obviously other options in our power or flower rooms to reduce that usage. Um, so that's something we're continually evaluating. Um, water conservation, as others have touched on, is hugely important, especially in Colorado, where we do have that desert like climate. Um, and so we want to make sure we're keeping a focus on that. Our watering system has been developed in a way to minimize that water use to make sure that the nutrients and the water are getting to the plants as efficiently as possible to reduce that extra usage. And we've also phased out RO water to kind of reduce that usage rate. We're looking for gathering no long-term numbers on that to have more of an idea of what that looks like. Um, but we anecdotally have seen that help out quite a bit. And the last thing I want to touch on is some of our other community engagement activities that kind of check off, especially those social and um, financial aspects. In 2019, Native Roots accumulated over 530 volunteer hours and around 1,300 volunteer hours since 2017 with Denver Parks and Rec, Denver Rescue Mission, Volunteers of America, and some other great organizations. Um, social justice wise, we've partnered to support the Turning Ever a New Leaf program, which um, helps uh, individuals vacate and seal low-level criminal marijuana convictions, which is very close to my heart coming from a conflict resolution um, and restorative justice background and addressing some of those harms from the years of prohibition. And lastly, we do partner with Focus Points Family Resource Center to help find uh, people in the local community to get jobs with us. Um, so it's important for people to work near where they live, both for community engagement and also for low income families. If you're having to commute across the entire state or to a different city, that just exacerbates your budgetary concerns, obviously. And with that, I will hand it off to Andrew Alfred, the Chief Scientist at LiveWell and Light Health. Yeah, thanks, Brandon. Um, and, and thanks to all the other panelists for your great content and uh, NCAA for hosting this on Earth Day. Um, 
I am with Level Enlightened Health. We are a vertically integrated um, cultivator, extractor, uh, and retailer. We are headquartered in Denver, where we operate um, 22 stores across the state. And we are um, just about finishing uh, making a um, building a cultivation facility in Detroit, uh, where we'll be servicing a similar uh, retail footprint as well. Uh, so I kind of wanted to talk about um, the, the, the concepts that we use throughout our supply chain. And I, I went and um, kept the, those three uh, triple P's, the environmental, economic, social pillars uh, down at the bottom. So if anyone is curious as they follow along, as they're hearing these different concepts being discussed, how they kind of fall into these different buckets. Uh, so I'll start with energy efficiency. Um, it's been talked about uh, before that uh, cannabis cultivation, especially indoor agriculture is um, energy intensive. And uh, most of that comes from uh, our use of electric lighting. And that for historically has been a big challenge um, to come up with solutions, but over the last uh, several years, um, great strides have been made in the horticultural LED um, world uh, in no small part due to the work that the cannabis industry has put in on the R&D side. I know uh, me personally, in my time at LiveWell for the last seven years, I've worked very closely with um, many of the major LED manufacturers across the, across the globe to develop and improve uh, fixtures, make them more cost effective, more affordable. Uh, and actually, thanks to the cannabis industry, there's been a bit of a revolution in the LED space. And you're starting to see LED lights being manufactured that are affordable to other crop types with, that might have um, smaller profit margins. You see this in leafy greens, lettuce, tomato farmers, and greenhouses. Um, so there was actually, we've talked about silver linings before there. Um, our need to, to strive for energy reduction ended up um, bolstering the LED manufacturer world. And, and now those energy savings are being passed on to other crop types. Um, we have committed at LiveWell to transition 100% of our legacy lighting to LED and all of our new construction will be 100% uh, LED lighting as well. We also work closely with our energy partners at Excel to develop the, a horticultural lighting rebate program. Um, we were the first recipients of that. It was back in 2015. And now that program is available for anyone uh, looking to invest in LED lighting. Um, you can get some pretty serious incentives up to 30% uh, rebates to help you make that uh, transition either with a renovation or a, a new construction project. Um, and we, we actually received a, an award from Excel in 2016 for the, the biggest lighting efficiency project in the whole state of Colorado. Um, and then we also use uh, advanced control systems to modulate our, um, our light output and our grow systems. Uh, you'd be really surprised, you know, even in the first 30 minutes of, of lights on in a photo period, uh, where the plant's photosystems haven't quite woken up yet, and you don't need to be giving 100% lighting intensity. By ramping up that um, your lights on in that, in that first window, over the entire year, you can achieve um, some pretty si uh, significant energy savings. So there's, there's little, little ways through control systems that you can, you can actually achieve some, some big uh, goals for sustainability. Um, with energy, uh, when you think about your lighting, it's also important to think about where your uh, power is coming from. Uh, when you're doing indoor agriculture, uh, almost all of your systems controlling your environment are going to be powered uh, from well, likely your grid and where is that, how is that power being generated from your local utility. In our facility in Michigan, uh, we were evaluating our um, energy options and we decided to um, build an on-site cogeneration plant. So we have um, CHP, uh, combined heat and power, uh, that will be, um, they'll be generated on site. You see some of our team standing in front of one of our generators. This will allow us to, to create our demand as we need it. And we'll be able to use, um, we'll be using natural gas for the energy, which compared to coal-based energy production, which is uh, very common in, um, in many municipalities, 
it has it is twice as efficient at producing uh, electricity. So effectively, your greenhouse gas em emissions are 50% 50 50 lower um, compared to coal. You know, when you live in a state like Colorado or when you're up in Canada, um, most utilities uh, have made commitments to be using renewable energy sources. So Canada is largely um, powered by uh, um, water streams. And in uh, Colorado, we've made a commitment to be uh, using solar and wind based uh, power as making up the majority of, of our state's energy portfolio. Uh, so it's really important to be mindful where you're cultivating of where your power is coming from. And when you think about, um, when you think about your power um, usage, you should also think about, about that in concert with your um, production. And so we like to calculate our production in terms of grams per kilowatt hour, how much energy in for what we're getting out. And you can use that metric to benchmark yourself and how well you're doing. And another high, uh, highlight that I'd like to make with the, um, by generating onsite, we're actually able to capture our CO2 from that combustion process and feed that into our plants uh, to boost our plant growth. That's uh, another um, kind of benefit. And um, the other resource we've been talking about a lot is water. And it can be a challenge to efficiently use water, um, particularly in outdoor where you can't really control the envelope, the environment. It can be lost um, to the air and, and, and never um, recaptured. When you're growing indoors, you actually have the ability to recollect all of the water that's um, that cycled through the plant through the transpiration pathway um, that gets recondensed in your dehumidification equipment uh, and you can collect all of your runoff water that you fed your plants that have trickled through the root system down into the floor drains and you can combine both of those sources and recycle it back into your irrigation equipment so uh, we are doing that we're, we're building that system in in michigan and we're looking forward to to turning that on when we when we cut the ribbon on that facility and here in denver we're also implementing this uh, similar technology and with that we're going to be able to um, reuse that water and it has a theoretical efficiency of, of up into the 90 percent uh, water reuse with just a little bit of makeup water being needed um, and then with that system we automate and feed our plants um, to to minimize the amount of, of water that each plant needs um, the other great um, benefit of growing indoors is space use efficiency so instead of um, typical outdoor cultivation where you just have one layer indoors you can grow in tiered systems and that space use efficiency can be really important for when you're when you're thinking about growing um, in urban centers where a lot of cultivation uh, locations are, uh, such as ours in Denver, where real estate can be very expensive. Uh, you can grow vertically to overcome that um, barrier. Another benefits of growing in urban centers is that you get to decrease the transportation miles the, that your product takes to get to retail locations. You get to decrease the transportation miles that your employees have to take to get to work. Uh, and so by using um, vertical cultivation systems, you're able to start thinking about your production in terms of cubic meters instead of uh, square meters. Um, beyond the cultivation um, technologies that we can use, we also like to think about um, just how we, we run our organization. And so we employ a quality management system. Uh, you see QMS, uh, GMP, GAP, kind of the alphabet soup thrown around a lot. And the, the real truth is that, you know, whether you're in Europe and it's EU GMP or here in the States with the FDA, um, eventually there's going to be um, uh, higher regulatory bodies that we're all going to have to answer to where this will, will, will be a requirement. But, but in the meantime, it's a, using quality management systems, standardizing your production, uh, ensuring that your product um, quality is, consistency, is consistent is a really important way on an organizational level to um, achieve resource efficiency. Um, and so we've committed to our Michigan facility of being um, completely GMP and GAP compliant. Um, beyond you know, thinking of resources organizationally, we think of our employees as our greatest resource. And so um, as part of our, our effort to, to ensure that their well-being um, is, is taken care of, we, we, we supply benefits to them uh, that we uh, 
that we value greatly, such as you know, higher than industry average wages, 100% paid health insurance, 401k contributions, uh, because when you know you work in your communities and your employees are part of your communities, making sure that your employees are taken care of um, is is a, a great priority when thinking about your impact. Um, beyond um, taking care of the employees that work for us, we also like to step out into the communities uh, that we, we serve to participate in regulatory affairs. We um, are on several uh, federal, state, and local uh, work groups and, and committees where we lobby to help the, this new emerging industry um, create policies that can help us be more sustainable. We've talked, everyone talked uh, a lot previously about uh, various recycling incentives and um, programs to um, figure out how to better use compost and plant waste. I would, I would say that there's still some regulatory burdens that are in our, that impeding progress for what to do with these secondary plant waste streams. Um, and beyond that, I think it's really important that we need to start figuring out ways to get um, secondary markets for, for these other plant products. Uh, so if you think about composting has been brought up, um, hempcrete is another um, classic uh, alternate uh, product that can be used with the, the plant waste that's non-flower, non-extractable. And those industries, those market demands need to pop up in order for um, producers, cultivators, to have um, a place to send these, these uh, what would be waste byproducts and to get them to be reused and turned into new things. I also included a link for you guys to check out this, our cannabis sustainability worker up here in Denver, made a little um, recycling package primer that can be put in dispensaries to help uh, educate uh, customers, consumers about what they can do with their various uh, packaging materials. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to touch on was um, our, our social outreach through our philanthropic arm, uh, Live Well Cares. We try our hardest um, to go out into, into communities where we do business and, um, and see how we can give back. Uh, I've listed a couple of, of highlights of places that, um, of organizations that we help support and you can visit our website to see others. I also um, wanted to mention that during this kind of crazy time with uh, COVID-19 and um, social distancing, we've uh, created emergency protocols that we've shared with our local communities and with industry organizations to, to help anyone out there who might need some guidance in, in writing their own um, SOP so that they can keep their doors open and keep their uh, employees coming to work, um, but also you know, maintain a safe environment. Uh, and so with that, I'll um, kick it back to Caitlin and, and thanks again to NCIA for uh, helping put this thing together. Awesome. Thank you all so much for that really fantastic panel. Um, we are a few minutes over the allotted presentation uh, time frame already and all of the panelists on this amazing panel have been doing a really great job of engaging with the audience inside the Q&A section of the platform. Um, so with that, I'm just going to pose just a very limited amount of questions uh, to the panel. I'll address them to Caitlin, who then she can turn it over to the, the best panelists from there to address. Um, I'll just choose from a few of the open questions that we still have remaining inside the Q&A section of the platform. Um, so we can address those that haven't been touched on yet. Uh, and then additionally, for all of you all that are still participating um, and might not have submitted a question through the uh, Q&A section of the platform, don't worry. Uh, our staff has been compiling all of those questions and we will collect those into a document for completion by the panelists after the event. And we will be sending you all of those uh, answers in a follow-up email. All right, so. Um, okay, perfect. Let's pick from the top here. So uh, this one's already directed towards James. So um, James, are hemp farms an issue for you um, as it relates to pollination? Um, and how close is the closest hemp farm to you? And do you know when their plants are ready to bloom? Uh, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, in Oregon, we do have regulations about the distance, but it's clearly not uh, good enough. Um, but I think that there is a hemp farm about 15 miles away 
thankfully, uh, my farm is not necessarily in an area that's conducive to large scale hemp farms. Uh, I think when I say large scale hemp farms, I'm thinking 50 to 500 acre type farms. Uh, most of those are in Southern Oregon um, and Eastern Oregon. So those cannabis cultivators out there are the ones that are dealing with more of that. Um, but it, it, is, it is a real concern and it has caused problems for a lot of farmers in the South. Um, you know, the, that brings up, I'll try and be quick, but it brings up one other question about how do you control for pollen in a, in a greenhouse type of environment. Um, it is difficult, you know, uh, the, in a greenhouse environment, you are opening your doors mostly to, to air. So even when you, in the best of circumstances, you're trying to control for all of the air moving through your facility, every time you have to open that door and bring new plants in or move stuff around, um, you, you are opening to that possibility. So I would say for anybody who's seriously dealing with that challenge is, you know, find out who's around you, uh, and, and find out how they're doing things. Um, a lot of hemp farmers, if they're quality hemp farmers, they're growing female hemp plants that produces the best flower. And with now with the, the majority of our hemp going to CBD type products, uh, we're not looking at so much of just kind of the industrial hemp that uh, is looking at fiber that ends up being a lot more male type plants with pollination problems. So, you know, my best suggestion is just really know who's around you. And, and that goes toward, towards that local, localized growing environment, cultivating environment that you're in and, you know, both on a macro scale and on a micro scale. Great. Awesome. Thank you for that extensive answer to that question. Really appreciate that. Um, perfect. Let's, let's just do one more question. I know that we're getting close to the time limit here. So um, this was one of the earlier uh, questions that got posed in the session in the chat room. Um, as producers and business people, what environmental impact can smart building technologies play in making the cannabis industry more sustainable? I would direct that, uh, that question to Andrew first, and then um, you know, maybe Brandon next, if I want to weigh in. Oh, Andrew, you're, you're on mute. mute. <laughs> I, uh, well, the first half of my answer was great. Uh, you'll just never hear it. The, when smart building concepts, I think there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I know other cultivators, you know, uh, Terrapin talked about you know, using lead engineers. Um, you know, getting a good design team together when you're putting together your building is very important. Um, we use a lot of sensors to um, have create feedback loops with our building automation system. Um, so we have an integrated control system that, that modulates temperature, humidity, lighting, uh, that entire environment for the crop. And there's two things there that I would speak to when I'm thinking of efficiency and sustainability. Um, when it's more energy efficient um, to have um, sensor-based uh, controls and integrated environmental control systems um, to maintain the environment that you want. And then also by optimizing those environments, you're going to be more productive um, and you know, generate more biomass, more plant material um, at, a, at a more efficient grams per kilowatt hour. Uh, so those, so obviously, in the, broadly speaking, those um, smart building design concepts are incredibly important. I, I, I would focus on your um, environment um, controlling systems. Yeah, I think, uh, I think Andrew nailed it. I don't have anything to add. Wonderful. I guess I would just, um, before we close, I mean, I'm very impressed with all the participation that we had on this webinar. Um, I think we had about 110 people on at the most, which um, for an environmental panel, that would be a record breaker at a in-person conference. So I'm excited that, you know, that many people have chimed in to celebrate Earth Day with us um, and really make sustainability a priority for the cannabis industry. I'm excited to see um, the change in the trend.
All right, fantastic. Well, thank you all so much for presenting that amazing panel. Um, not only was it very timely with uh, the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, but um, it was really, really great to, to hear a lot of information about how we're helping push you know, sustainability practices within our industry, but also all the great work that a lot of you all are spearheading is now being taken into consideration uh, in other outside industries as well. Um, so thank you all for the, uh, the, the audience members for participating in the very lively uh, and engaging Q&A uh, session as well. Um, if any of you all have any uh, follow-up remarks or questions or want to just reach out to any of the panelists uh, directly after this session, um, this contact information slide has all of their emails as well as some additional resources related to their companies. Um, all of you all will be sent a PDF version of this slide deck immediately upon conclusion of the webinar. Um, so you'll be able to pull that information from there. And then in addition, you'll also be sent a video recording of the webinar um, no later than 72 hours uh, post event um, once you all complete a survey. So stay on the uh, lookout for all those resources to review this great content uh, after this session has wrapped up. And before we do conclude, I do just have a few sort of uh, announcements and housekeeping notes that we did want to um, wrap things up with today. So um, if all of you all haven't heard, um, we did postpone our upcoming seventh annual Cannabis Business Summit and Expo from June until late September. This decision wasn't made lightly. However, NCIA's primary goal throughout the crisis is protecting the health and safety of our community and the nation at large. You can head to the CannabisBusinessSummit.com to sign up to receive all the exciting news that we're really, uh, really excited to be releasing in the coming weeks, and then register as soon as you're able to commit to traveling to an in-person trade show later this year. Uh, additionally, we also postponed our 10th annual Cannabis Industry Lobby Days from its usual time uh, in late, sp or late spring until fall. So do mark your calendars today as the most impactful two days for cannabis industry advocacy will now be held from September 15th to September 17th in Washington, D.C. And have you been feeling the pinch from the lack of exposure at in-person events over the last few weeks? Uh, you're not alone, uh, and NCIA is here to help. I'm super excited to announce that we have released a wealth of digital marketing sponsorship packages across our highly trafficked platforms. And you can head to our website to learn more and then schedule a meeting with one of our biz dev team to discuss in more detail today. And last but not least, I would like to formally invite all of you all to attend the next three editions of our new industry essential educational webinar series taking place just next week. If you didn't miss, in case you missed it at the start of the presentation, our Industry Essentials is our new weekly educational series featuring a variety of programs that allow us to provide you timely, engaging, and essential education when you need it most. We'll have two public webinars taking place next week on Monday, April 27th, with the first one entitled Committee Insights, Managing Novel Risks During the COVID-19 Crisis, which is being hosted by NCIA's Risk Management Committee. Next up, we have the first edition of our Cannabis Summit Speaker Series feature, featuring Eric Schlischel of Geek Tech and Joey Ellison of Sophos Cybersecurity presenting a session entitled Hacker Proof Your Remote Operations. These two webinars are free for all, so please head to NCIA's website to sign up today. And finally, I'm very pleased to announce the launch of our new members only Fireside Chats with NCIA Government Relations Team series taking place next Wednesday, April 29th, with a session entitled Staying Politically Engaged in the Age of Coronavirus, an update from Washington, D.C. These intimate discussions are an exclusive opportunity for NCIA members to hear from our government relations team and guests about the latest developments in federal policy. Next week's session will focus on providing NCIA members with ideas on how to effectively communicate while practicing social distancing and guide you on how to navigate the political process during this difficult time. And with that, I just want to uh, pass along a huge thank you um, to all of our panelists and participants in the webinar this afternoon. Uh, thank you all for lending your expertise and your time and uh, helping us provide this very valuable educational content to all of our members and supporters. And thank all of you all for participating in the very lively conversation and supporting our efforts by spreading the word about this great educational content. If you all haven't 
um, consider joining NCIA today, please uh, head over to the uh, cannabisindustry.org slash join to learn more about all the benefits that you'll gain by joining our organization. And we hope to see you all next week on the next educational webinars taking place on Monday. With that, thank you all so much. You all have a great day and we'll see you next time.